So in my case, I, uh, I first came to Chaco in 1972, and I was a student of Florence Holly Ellis. And so I was on the Chaco, the 72 Chaco survey, which was the, essentially the first survey, the inventory survey. And uh, we, were, we were just doing resource management I mean, we were recording everything that everything that fell in front of us. We drew it and took put a sight stake in it and took a picture of it and filled out a form and this is standard stuff. And this was uh, uh, how should I put it? The 1970s was the beginning of this kind of standard stuff. As a student of Florence, I uh, I was I was uh, sort of how should I say, marinated in the old school. And um, I used to run the Slick Rock up here above Bonito and one evening, which was probably, I mean, we, were, we weren't aware of solstices or equinoxes or sun or moon activity or, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't even in the discussion. I mean, basically we had a list of, of possibilities and there were some things that were not on that list, like mounds or earthen anything, um, uh, pyramids, <laughs> or anything that looks, or, you know, anything like that. Anything that was, quote, Mesoamerican was purely taboo that could be correlated with Mesoamerica. And so we had a, we had a short list that had to be a Pueblo or a, or a lithic scatter or, or your basic basic stuff. So being a student of Florence's and running the Slick Rock in a day which was probably a significant day, I was above Bonito uh, as the sun set. And I looked into that thing and it was, a, it was, it was just a stunning collection of, of geometric shadows. And, and they were, you know, it, it just struck me that there's no way that this thing was anything like uh, uh, some of the structures that I had seen, uh, say, for example, in the Chama Valley and uh, had been exposed to in the Rio Grande Valley. It was just, it was, it was something out of this world. And I didn't know what. I didn't have any of this in my vocabulary. I mean, it, it couldn't think about it. All I could think about it was, man, this is an incredible place. So I was, I was in Chaco for the seasons of the 72 and 74 in the survey. And then in, in, by 76, I had, I, had, uh, I had been working with Mike Marshall and we were doing contract work, which by that time, the Moss Bennett bill was signed in 73. And that opened up federal funding for uh, anything that was a government uh, undertaking. So if it's a federal undertaking, the funds were available and all of a sudden, you know, archeologists just sprouted up in the ground and I was one of them. And so Mike and I were doing various surveys and uh, for us, I have no idea how this happened, but Rich Luce, who was, who was a, a key player here in the canyon at the Chaco Center, he was with the Remote Sensing Center and he was the man that uh, that did the trenches across the roads and uh, dug the trench across uh, the Chetra Kettle quote field. And um, he had, uh, well, God, the stories could go on and on. But anyway, he had left the Park Service and was the archeologist for the public service company. And he had contacted the SHPO, the SHPO, Tom Merlin. Uh, at the time, this was the first the first round of industry-related uh, threats to the San Juan Basin. And the PNM needed to know where the sites were so they could plan. Ironically, it was an air quality issue. So Rich cooked up a, uh, he wrote the proposal for a project to, uh, to identify all the big sites in the San Juan Basin. And uh, so, so it was a cooperative adventure between the state of New Mexico and the public service company. And uh, the work that we did uh, was uh, published as uh, uh, what we call Anasazi Communities. 
of the San Juan Basin. You know, we didn't call it Chaco communities of the San Juan Basin, we called it Anasazi communities, but it's been interpreted as Chaco. But on that survey, well, several things. One, we, we began to, re to realize that, that the, uh, the appearance of these big buildings wasn't random, that they were, in fact, there was a pattern and that we interpret these things broadly as uh, public or civic architecture. And uh, that was about the extent of it at the time. I mean, we were still, we were still stuck with the old ideas of, uh, you know, what, you know, I guess one of the things we would say is that there's no middens with these things. So, you know, so they break the pattern. They're not, uh, so we were trying to interpret these things. Well, and that, that was the project that went to Congress for the uh, outlier legislation. So the outlier legislation is based on that publication, and you know, not not entirely, but largely. And uh, well, so, I, what am I, I? What I'm getting at, I guess, is that was the beginnings of. We were at the beginning of understanding that we were we weren't looking at something that was purely cultural, we were looking at something that was political. And we were looking at it at several different levels. We were looking at it at the, at the what you might call the national level, the canyon, and the big, the big, the big, uh, the big stuff, <laughs> the really big stuff. And the next level, the community level. And we hadn't got to the point yet to where we were, we were picking out the details, basically.